Well, for those of you watching, right, necessity is the mother of invention. So, obviously, there's, it's echoing in here. Uh, we've really cut our Sunday and Wednesday services down as far as attendance considerably, which is great to be in compliance with what the experts say. Um, just a few notes for those of you that normally come Wednesday or even Sunday and you're, you're now getting to watch on Wednesday. I'm uh, just going to go over some of the things we're doing. We're constantly monitoring what the experts are saying and trying to keep everybody safe. Uh, I put out a directive to my staff, elders, pastors, etc., that if they have any symptoms, not to come to the church of anything and to contact me, go see a doctor, and ask about COVID-19. Uh, so to be tested if they can and do what the doctor says and if they need to be quarantined, to be quarantined. Now, a lot of questions are coming into the church. There's a lot of fear out there. So we want to allay those fears, letting you know that we're doing everything we can to do the right thing as far as what the experts say. Uh, just so you know, we're also starting a helps ministry. We already have food for the soul. We do feed people. We do um, deliver. Uh, so a lot of really neat things. We have a benevolence packet for those that are struggling. But now we're going to have another branch of the food for the soul ministry called, it's not called anything right now. It's, it's really a helps ministry. And basically, um, you know, we're expanding it for people who maybe need a delivery, for people who uh, lost their job and they're coming into financial peril. It pretty much covers anything that could happen to somebody called the church. 732 uh, 521 Plus, we have the website www.ccrossfields.org. And again, you know, we just want to help people in this difficult time. We will ab abide by all the rules of the state and the local municipalities, depending on, con you know, regarding contact and all that stuff. So uh, just give us a call if you need help. Those of you who have been members of this church, that maybe you're part of that target audience that's struggling, um, please give us a call if you need anything. So a lot of things going on. Uh, we've changed our Wednesday night service time from 7.30 to 7 p.m. And we started to live stream to cut down on the amount of people that come. We, we were above, we were below 50 anyway. Now we're even less than that. So that's a good thing. Um, yeah, basically, Pastor Paul and I have been making phone calls. If we hear that anybody is sick, we call them up. The question comes up about COVID-19. Make sure you see a doctor. Don't come to church until you see a physician. Follow all their directives. So Pastor Paul and I have been calling a lot of people up. Listen, uh, one of our home groups, uh, one of the, the leaders had an allergy attack and had a runny nose and stuff. I'm like, listen, you're going to freak people out. Just cancel the home group. So we're doing everything in our power to keep the church going, but uh, teach get the message out there, but also to take all the precautions that the expert tell us to take. Uh, let's see. On Sunday, just so you know, if you're watching your Wednesday night people, you're watching on the live stream, if anyone shows any symptoms, we will be turning them away. So please don't get mad at me. I got people mad at me on both sides. <laughs> uh, if you're symptomatic in any way, we're going to send you home. So don't come to the church. We love you. We will pray for you. We will contact you over the phone, but we just can't take any chances. This is not just for COVID-19. This is also for the flu. The flu has killed oh, 18,000 people in the United States so far this season. So it's way above the kill rate. I hate to say it. The mortality rate is a better word than COVID-19. But a death is a death. If somebody dies from A, B, or C, or a car crash, it's still tragic. So we want to minimize all risk. OK, what else do we have here? Uh, same thing goes with people who've been in, traveled uh, to California, Seattle, some of these high-risk areas, even though they don't show symptoms, we're asking them to self-quarantine. Um, so, you know, we're working on a lot of things this week to even divide the church into two venues with the downstairs and the fellowship hall, which is really at the edge of the other wing of the church, and it's also downstairs, it has its own exit. So we're going to make use of that to open everything up so people have more distance. And we're going to, we're getting a lot of suggestions. And at first, they're like, oh, everybody's throwing suggestions. But they're good suggestions. 
another suggestion that we're going to have that we're going to do on Sunday is we're going to every other pew we're going to have uh, taped off so to try to maintain that six foot barrier that's what we have to do all right hopefully in a few weeks they lift all these that the you know the graph starts to level out or dip I talked about the graph last Sunday for infectious diseases okay I don't want to beat this to death um, you know or okay I, I'm uh, the other thing last thing that I'll say is that I'm giving my leaders latitude with even their small groups if they feel uncomfortable and they want to cancel so we've canceled Food for the Soul, we've can't, on Friday we've canceled Three Strands Saturday night and Women's Devotion Saturday morning. Those leaders said to me, I feel, this is how I feel about this. It just, as less people coming into the building, I said, no problem, not gonna, you know. Your health is more important than how many people show up at the church. So I hope that, you know, I put everybody's, and I'm really talking to the live stream people because there's only a few of you here and you already know this. Um, so anyway, I had to get that out of the way. All right. That being said, if you would turn with me to Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6, great portion of Scripture in the Old Testament. All right, Isaiah 6, very powerful. And I think this is a good perspective, especially with all the... It's just amazing. I, I don't understand it. I don't know if it's a social media thing. I mean, I'm 52. I'm maybe starting to become a dinosaur. But, you know, back in the day, we didn't have social media. We actually talked to each other. We argued with each other. And we were friends. Um, now it's people get on social media and they, they have differences of opinion with all this. And people are just really getting angry at each other. Um, this is a good scripture to kind of put everything back in the perspective so that we could see really who's on the throne, and we see literally it's the Lord who's on the throne. So in Isaiah 6, starting with verse 1, now this is Isaiah speaking, the prophet, in the year that King Uzziah died, he was also known as King Azariah, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it, the train stood seraphim, or above it, the thrones stood seraphim. These are order of angels. Each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That's my best angel voice. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So pretty neat. A little bit about King Uzziah. He was a very popular king. He got stuff done. Um, if I could, based on what I read about him, he was a go-getter. He was proactive. He um, was opposite of lazy. And the people really loved him. I mean, he was the king and served for, for just about 52 years. I went into secular sources, too. Of course, they all agree with what the Bible says. So Uzziah was the king of the southern kingdom, of Judah, where Jerusalem was. He served for 52 years. He was very popular. But Isaiah said he died. And that's the nature of humankind. We die. Some die younger, some die older. And I think my point is, is that who are we relying on? Who do we look to? Right? Who do we look to leaders? Right? Actually, pointed up Jesus. And that's very important because when we look at people, eventually they're gone. So King Uzziah dies, and no doubt there was a national mourning for him. But King Uzziah wasn't perfect. He was a king, and he got a little, well, that's putting it nicely, he got very lifted up with pride, and he tried to be a priest too. He tried to go into the temple and do the things that the priests did. And to their credit, they, they chased him out. There was a confrontation. Uh, but when he fell, God gave him leprosy, and it humbled him, and it got him back on track with God. Now remember, God held, it says it in, in the Bible as well, for us as leaders, you know, let us not all become leaders because you're held to a higher standard, right? And, and different versions say it a little bit differently, but uh, he tried to be king and priest, and he fell. This is so important, and this is why I say, who do we look to? Because people fall, right? They pass away. Oh my goodness, that person's not there anymore. 
um, they, f- they fall into sin. They do stupid things. Uh, and that's why it's so important to look at the Lord Jesus Christ because you, you're, there's a really incredible contrast that the prophet is seeing. I, I think this was more of a vision. Um, you can, you know, almost similar to John in the book of Revelation, which we're going to be covering starting this Sunday. I'm very excited about it. But there is a contrast. King Uzziah is no longer on the earthly throne. They buried him. Uh, They gave him a dignified Jewish burial. And that's it. He's gone. Somebody else goes to sit on the throne. However, Isaiah is seeing a vision, or maybe he's literally transported into this, you know, the Bible tells us that even the earthly temple was a copy of what's in heaven. So Isaiah's taken, either whether he's taken literally to the, the temple on earth and he sees God in that temple or he's taken and Bible scholars d- differ and that's okay because that's not the point. You know, I, I'm the kind of person that I try to, you know, ferret out all the different theories. But the point is that the Lord is on the throne. And the cool thing about the Lord being on the throne is he's not going to die and be replaced by somebody. You know, the Jewish people like uh, there was, uh, I think the next guy, Jotham, was okay, and then he, they got Ahaz, and he was horrible. And you see this declension in the morality of the kings, and the people had to suffer through that. But Isaiah is seeing that the true king was on the throne, period. And he's not going to fall into sin because he's perfect, and he's not going to die because he's eternal. So you see this really neat contract and, uh, contrast, and folks, we have to look at that today. There's people we admire, there's people we respect. Um, Was it last year I lost two of my favorite Bible teachers? I mean, I didn't know them personally. Well, I knew their work. They didn't know me, but now they're in glory. Um, Norman Geisler, one of my favorite apologetics um, theologians, and also uh, Warren Wiersbe. You know, they both passed away, and I I got sad. But you know what? The Lord's still here. Um, So it's pretty neat. The description is glorious. The Lord is on the throne, and the train of his robe is filling the temple. Ah, that's amazing. You know, the, I don't know, it's, he's got a spirit, right? He sees a form of the living God. He sees what God allows him to see as, as God did that with Moses. No man, no sinful person could see his full glory and live. So even what, whatever God was showing them at the time, the Lord, it was still amazing. And you see Isaiah writing this stuff down in black and white. Very exciting stuff. And the train of his robe, he, he's, I don't know, I mean, if it was me, I'd be the same way. I'd be like, oh, I think it looks like a train, you know, and he's, this is the angels, they got six wings, and, and you're, st- you're taking stuff down, but you're just a human being. Boy, where do we see it in the kingdom? Is That's going to be amazing. And then we're going to see a, a true appreciation, because when we go to be with the kingdom, right, sinful flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. So we're going to be ready to see it. Our hearts are going to be right. We're going to be perfected. And then we're going to see God as he is. That's going to be an amazing thing. It's the whole sin thing and the fallen flesh that just gets in the way of everything. But it's, it's, this, is, this is really neat. The Lord is still on the throne, even in times of uncertainty. And again, whether it's the pandemic, and we, you know, we've had them over the years, we've had them ever since the beginning of time, you see it in the Bible all the way back to Leviticus and, uh, you know, the plagues. And so you see these things that, unfortunately, in a fallen creation, we have these little microscopic buggers that try to harm us, right? And we can't see them, and it could be a little frightening. And then uh, frightening for other people is the person who's lost their job in this economy. Or what about churches that are worried, well, are we going to still be standing after this thing is gone? And pastors are asking themselves that question. I just have to keep, like Isaiah, Isaiah and I have something in common. We, we just have to keep focusing on the Lord. You know what I'm saying? And as a church, this, honestly, this is our time to shine. When people are terrified, when they're in fear, when they're in panic, this is our time to shine. You know, and I'm talking to a lot of Christians who are just going out there and being able to minister to people. And that's what it's all about, folks. When, when human beings that never consider God are going through this world, and they're interrupted by something that's beyond their control, they're looking for answers. And even the most hard-hearted people sometimes, and I know for those of you that are out there in the work field, that 
they're a little bit more open to hearing what you have to say about God. How, how are you handling this? Right? Now, it's okay as Christians to have a personal concern, times of fear and doubt. I mean, that happens. But we should not be, and this was what bothers me and the things that I see, is that Christians call themselves Bible-believing Christians or they're one of the people running around the road with their hair on fire. First of all, if we panic during a time like this, does that accomplish anything? Let's look at this logically, and the answer is no. As a matter of fact, it lowers your immune system. You're in a, a constant state of a sympath sympathetic nervous system response. It literally, studies have shown that it lowers your immune system, makes you more susceptible. So as, as people of God, we're allowed to have those quiet times and take it to the Lord and say, Lord, take this from me. We're not superhuman, but you know, we should be the ones that hopefully are witnesses such that people in the world who are looking for answers, they come to, and we can give them those answers. That's important. We're going to look back on this, and we're going to say, wow, that was an opportunity, not that God did this, but it was an opportunity for the church to shine. Right? Jesus says that. You know, there's a funny thing about, I, I went to college, I went to the police academy, right? I went to my studies as a pastor. I went to all the schools, and then I was thrown out into the field to actually do it. And this is where we're thrown out into the field, folks. This is where, this isn't the classroom anymore. This is the real deal. People are dying. People are afraid. People are panicking. What are we doing as Christians? This is our time to shine and show them the true and living God. It doesn't mean we're perfect. It just means that hopefully we have the answers. And the reason we have the answers is because we have the Bible. Right? Not because we're geniuses. You know, I know I'm not. He's speaking about the seraphim. I, I have to put this in perspective, and I almost have to laugh that there's some that call themselves Christians or whatever, and I try to be nice about this, and they're, they worship angels. They're angel worshipers. Well, let's look at the seraphim, the cherubim, and the different order of angels that serve at the behest of the living God. They don't call the shots. They serve God. They serve the Lord. So these seraphim, seraph means to burn, the burning ones is one way to translate it. I think the coolest thing is they got six wings. I mean, listen, we're not supposed to worship angels, but they're one of God's creations. I don't know. And they're like cool. I mean, it must be cool to look at. How big are their wings? I don't know, but we'll find out. With six wings, they have two that cover their face, two that cover their feet, and two of them which cause them to hover above the throne. That's got to be a wild thing to see. So they don't even need six of them. The four do something, and the two just kind of, they're chilling, you know, just kind of on each side of the Lord. Very exciting. Um, you could imagine with two, they're covering their face. Let's we'll start with the face. <laughs> Showing Isaiah that this is God. Even we, you know, we respect his glory, right? They were covering our face. With two, they covered their feet. Where God is, is, is sacred ground. Our feet should not touch the ground. And, and again, Bible, I, I like to not argue with people who differ in some of the minute uh, interpretations. I just find this fascinating, so I just want to talk about it. So with two, they cover their feet, and with two, they got to stay in the air so their feet don't touch the ground. <laughs> Pretty neat. Um, anyway, we shouldn't worship angels. We shouldn't worship any creative thing. Unfortunately, we live, in a, we live in a culture, unfortunately, where a lot of us worship ourselves. And that's a shame. And that's a more insidious, more private, more not in the open type of sin. Self-worship. Three, he says, the angel cried to another. You know, God's in the center and one looks at the other and they look at each other and they say, holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is full of His glory. And it is. When we get into the book of Revelation, we'll see this fallen creation through God's judgment starts to now majorly deteriorate. But even with what we're going through, what we're seeing, when you go outside and you see the sun, and you see, I'm looking at the buds on the trees, you know, as I get older, I'm more kind of nature-y sort of, a nature lover. Um, just watching nature start to come alive again the animals like where these birds come from you know <laughs> where did all these little creatures come from in the winter time when it was freezing well they're all out now the bugs the insects my bees are buzzing my beehive is active uh, so it's really nice god's glory really is covering the earth and check it out we're enjoying his glory in a fallen creation check that out so is 
you know, from God's perspective, I can almost see him saying to us, oh, wait till I redo this place. Oh, you love it now? You, you, there's just no comparison. And I can't wait. You know, it's, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing you all smile. And maybe we came in here and, and we, you know, know somebody who's sick and we were going to a job that, you know, we could get infected. But when you come into the church and you read the Word and you're like, you know what, this transcends everything. Because God has been on the throne forever. Um... Continuing on, verse 4, everything is shaken just by the sound of the angel's voice. And that's just the angel. You know, the posts were, if, you, if it was the, it, it probably was the literal temple because if it was God's temple, I don't think things would be kind of rattling. But, and I look at the little details, I get kind of caught up on side issues. Uh, but the, the posts, when the, if it was the real, the actual temple in Jerusalem, I mean, you, you couldn't move this. A hundred guys couldn't move that post. It's just with the stonework and the woodwork and everything fitting in perfectly. The ancients probably did even a much better job than craftsmen today in making things not only beautiful, but incredibly sturdy and strong. And they were under God's directives. But the angel's voice, it, it, you know, it's starting to shake, which is, Isaiah must have been blown away. It must have been sensory overload. Um, remember when the ark was brought into the temple, uh, God's glory drove the priests out. You know, it, it just was this smoke that developed and the priests ran out. They, it was so incredible and so powerful and thick that they had to run out. We'll see this again in Revelation, I believe it's 15, when we get to it. So, um, yeah, so verse 5, good stuff. Then I said, Isaiah says, woe is me, for I am undone. I'm destroyed, literal translation, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it and said, behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin purged. So five through seven is, five is a reaction Isaiah says it with his words. It's a reaction to God's glory, and the reaction is repentance. Right? He's, he's, could you imagine if you were him seeing this? I mean, this is grandiose, just reading it in black and white. Imagine being there. You'd probably be, I'd probably be scared. I'd be, I'd be terrified, well, not knowing what's going to happen next. People got visited on earth by angels, and they freaked out because angels are just powerful creatures. So, repentance. You know, when you have a born-again experience, you, you get close to God either through His Word or somebody witnessing. I remember for me, when I had my experience, my, I came up to the pulpit when it was an altar call, and my, I still remember, this was 20-something years ago, my knees were shaking, and I, my hands were shaking, and I'm holding on, and this was just in a church. But to me, it was a big step in my life. So, like Isaiah, I, my pastor did a great job of teaching the Bible, and it had an, a, a powerful effect on me that had a situation where my body was, was kind of shaking. And I don't have a problem saying that because he's just amazing. Um, verses 6 through 7 is interesting. But remember, this is pre, pre the cross. So this is good. When you, when you study the Bible, you're supposed to exegete, not eisegete. That means you're supposed to take out of the Bible what God wants you to take out, not read into it something from your own life, biases or the culture. So you see this, this situation where the angel flies over to him and he's got this you know, hot coal with tongs from the altar. He touches his mouth and he says, you know, your iniquity or your sin is taken away, your sin is purged. Again, this was pre-Christ. This was a, a, a foreshadowing of what Jesus was going to do on the cross. And there was a lot of foreshadowings in the Old Testament, so don't, don't get hung up on that. Um, Jesus, you know, He paid the price for our sins. We know that. So this is a, a little bit of a foreshadowing, I believe. Verse 8, He says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and whom will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. This is another manifestation of, of Christ, right? Because us, God refers. And, and this isn't the first time in the Old Testament that God has referred to Himself as us. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We keep getting on the subject of modalism and some of these teachers, these you know, preachers um, eat, write books and they're on TV and they're TV preachers and they, 
they, they, it's weird the way they talk about God. Like He's in heaven and then He takes His whole self down to the earth as Jesus. And there's nobody in heaven. There's no Holy Spirit. But God just keeps changing shape, which is actually, um, it's mythology. It's uh, false teaching. It's, it's some weird stuff that was taught uh, you know, close to you know, over almost 2,000 years ago. It's called uh, modalism. But we know that God refers to him, just like we are, right? God made man in his own image, body, mind, spirit. Now, we don't always agree with each other because part of us has fallen. But Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they, they're always in agreement, you know, which is a really neat thing. That's a whole other discussion, the Trinity. Um, but this is, this is amazing here because God says, you know, I have something to do. Now, God could do everything. He doesn't need the angels. He doesn't really. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need me. But He honors us and He at times asks, you know, well, He really wants us to, to join in. You know, we've been given the gifts of the Spirit for a reason in the New Testament. We find that in 1 Corinthians. You know, God wants us to, He's like the CEO of, of the entire creation. And he's good and he's perfect and he wants to kind of take us aboard in like a training program and he wants us to to do his will and that's that's an if you think about it, that's an honor sometimes and it's sad people in the church look at that as oh you want me to serve or you want me to do something i don't want you to do anything i want you to use your spiritual gifts to serve the living god and that's between you and him we'll provide a venue for it uh but you know this is what we're supposed to do and if we're truly changed by the living God, we want to serve Him in some way. Now, there's a lot of people who have ministries that are outside the building of the church, and that's fine. What, what is your gift, and how does God want you to serve Him? That's important. So who will go for us? I know for me, when I had an experience with the living God, I wanted to do something. And I, <laughs> the church at the time that I was in was a big church, so I, I did the children's ministry for a time. I ushered. I did all kinds of stuff, and then behold, I became a pastor. So um, it is, it's just, it's a, definitely a labor of love. You want to serve the Lord. You want to tell everybody how great he is. That's exciting. Verses 9 through 10, continuing on, he said, God says, and this is the sad part, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their ears, see with their eyes, you don't see with your ears, and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. This was a difficult time in Israel. Uh, the people were uh, starting to fall back into idolatry. It's a shame. They were starting to do the ungodly things that their pagan neighbors were doing. And they started to get real crummy kings. And there's a very, there's a very interesting scripture that God will allow false prophets to rise up he'll allow false you know king ungodly kings to rise up because it was a reflection of the culture at the time that's a hard concept to preach because politicians are often a reflection of their constituents so what does that say about our culture in new jersey i'll leave that for you to decide it's true if if why do we keep letting these politicians get i mean back in the day um, if you had a bad king, you were kind of stuck with him. Now we can vote them out, but a lot of times we don't. Like we have this idea, we keep it, voting the same people in, and uh, you know, over decades. And it's because we want to get the money to come to New Jersey. It isn't character more important? Isn't what they stand for more important than how much money comes in from the federal government? It's just, it's a big game. So here, God allowed evil kings to rise up. He allowed that. And it was a reflection of the people. And sometimes their wickedness, some of the people actually repented. They're like, well, you know, we were bad, but we're not that bad. And they actually repented and turned back to God. It's an interesting thing, that whole cycle of estrangement from God and then coming back. You know, so, so this is where we're at. Make no mistake, Isaiah had a difficult ministry. So you see what Isaiah says, you know, so what's my job description? And God's like, uh, here it is. And I don't know, Isaiah didn't say, well, that, I don't really like that. Can you give me like a better ministry? You know, that one doesn't sound like it's a lot of fun. And it's really sad that in American, <laughs> you have to 
you talk about that, that series or that documentary, American Gospel, um, there's this idea in the West that the prosperity gospel and some of these preaching, and it's just unrealistic. It's almost like these guys would never get into ministry if they actually had to do hard work and get dirt under their fingernails, but you know, they're, they're posh, they have multiple planes, they live very well, and it's very easy for them to preach that type of message. But that's not, I don't know how, why so many people follow them, because that's not, you know what's really sad? Sometimes following these prosperity preachers is like wanting to win the lottery. You're hoping that they're right so that you could cash in. So, yeah, there's a problem with false teachers and false prophets, but there's also a problem with people who listen to them. Right? Sometimes God's like, you know, you don't, you know, in um, in Jerusalem before the Babylonians came in, good people like Jeremiah the prophet were in prison. They were abused. They were starved. They were thrown into cisterns. They were put in prison. They were killed. But the false prophets got to sit at the king's tables. They got to speak to the masses. And it's, it, the problem is people didn't want God. They wanted to hear what they wanted to hear. And sadly. If the church goes through a persecution in this country, you're really going to see what the church is made of. Because a lot of people are just in it for what's in it for them. They're not in it for what's in And this is so important. Do I want to serve myself or do I want to serve God? A lot of people want to serve themselves. When you read this, it's an eye-opener. It's a smack in the face. It's walking outside and it's minus 20 degrees and the cold hits you and you're you know, your mustache freezes or something like that. But for those of you who have mustaches. Um, but you know what I'm saying. I mean, the people's hearts were hard. They weren't going to change. And I don't, I don't know. Is, is our culture going to consider God through the trials that we go through? I would say for some of you, uh, we lost uh, two, two from the... I have to put this disclaimer out. We have two people in our pastoral team that have to see a doctor. It's not for COVID. So just... It's not. <laughs> Separate things. I don't want to go into HIPAA violations, but, you know, what if uh, one of us breaks our leg tomorrow and, you know, the, the herd starts thinning? Are there people here, in the sound of my voice, in this room, that would step up to come up here, to take our place, right? You never know when God is going to call you to step up. I, I, was, I, I loved God when I got saved and I wanted to serve him, but I, I never really jumped in with two feet until one of my mentors died of cancer. And his funeral was so powerful. He And his life was so powerful. And so many people were there. It's not about numbers, but... And I'm listening to the testimonies. And I'm like, wow, he didn't just affect me. He affected hundreds of people. And he was so humble. And when he died, I got to be honest with you, I stepped up to the plate. I was like, I got to stop dawdling. I got to stop, you know, doing, putting my toe in the water. So, you know, you have to kind of look at these things. Um, when is that opportunity? Yeah, if we go through dark times, are you ready to step up to the plate? Whatever the, whatever the plate that is, God knows, right? We're not going to, pastors, we're not, you know, we're going to get old. If we don't die of something, we'll eventually die of old age. And if the Lord tarries, we're going to need some people to step up and, and do this. You know what I'm saying? Oh, it's hard. It was hard for me. I was working two jobs, but I either had to jump into it or I had to just keep serving myself. And everybody's got to come to that decision in life. Uh, verse 11, continuing on, 11 and 12, he, then I said, Lord, <laughs> I kind of find the humor in this. God tells him what a difficult ministry it's going to be. And he says, Lord, how long? <laughs> I, I just may, but I think it's humorous. And the Lord says, until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant, the houses are wet without a man, the land is utterly desolate, the Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Okay, so it's, it's a harsh reality. And here's the thing. God didn't really give him a direct answer. He said, well, these are the conditions that you're going to see. He didn't say for five years. He didn't say for ten years. He didn't say do it for this long and then you can retire. He just said... He gave Isaiah what he needed to know. I think sometimes in prayer as believers, it's almost like we demand that he give us some answer. But a lot of times, well, not a lot of times, the Bible says that we live by faith and not by sight. And I ask God a lot of things because I want to know how to lead properly. But sometimes God just walks with me and he's quiet. He doesn't say a whole lot, but I know he's there. Um, 
So, you know, we, we, we have to get out of this mindset, again, in, in a lot of American uh, Christianity is to demand an answer from God. And you just keep saying it. You say it in faith. And, you know, God has to, I've heard this, God has to answer you. Really? Read this and tell me that God has to do anything for me. He doesn't have to do anything for me. You know, the fact that He's with me and the fact that I know He's there and the fact that He's going to welcome me when my heart stops beating, that's it's going to have to be enough. This, this idea of demanding things from God is just, I don't understand it because it's not in the Scripture. Verse 13, but yet a tenth will be in it. A tenth. And will turn, return and be for consuming as a terebinth tree or as an oak whose stump remains when it is cut down so the holy seed shall be its stump. So the last part of this is there's always hope. A tenth. You know, God said to Elijah, was it 7,000? Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, who wouldn't bow the knee to Baal in Israel? Turn around. It's not just you, Isaiah. Yeah, I mean, um, Elijah. Got to get my people straight. Um, and it, it seemed like a small number. Well, well it's, that's actually 7,000 is pretty good. Um, correct me. Shout out if I got the number wrong. 7,000? Okay, I got a few thumbs up. But to, to Elijah, when the queen threatened him with the full weight of her army, he was scared and he ran away. And there's always, even in this area, even in America, even in any country, there's going to be that small remnant of people that are really true believers. And I want to be in that remnant. I want to be the one that God says, you know, in this area, I don't have a lot of people, but boy, they're faithful and they're loyal to me. And, you know, this is exciting to me. I mean, just watching the news is so depressing. And then coming here and teaching the Word, and this is where it's at. And this is why we need to help people and point them into this book. It was a last-minute thing that I was asked to fill in tonight. So I'm like flipping pages, and I'm trying to type something out. And I'm like, and the Lord's like, you got this, man. You know, you, you got this. You, you know who I am. You know my glory. You love this Scripture. So I'm like, all right, let me, let me just go into Isaiah 6 and just encourage people with the glory of God. He's still on the throne. And there's always hope. And there's always a tenth. And I love this because I actually had a tree that was cut down and from its stump came all these shoots. And if you let it grow long enough and you, you, you go about with your life in a few years' time, it'll be a tree again. It'll something will, it, it seemingly something will give life and bring life out of something that appears to be dead. And that's what God does. So this, him saying to Isaiah, you're going to have a tough ministry. It's not my will to tell you how long it's going to be. The people are going to give you a really hard time. You're going to get a lot of pushback. You get a lot of opposition. But you're doing my will. And before you know it, there's going to be new shoots and new growth. And there's going to be a new remnant of people. Maybe the little kids. Maybe the next generation that are going to come up and they're going to worship me. And your work is going to seemingly be difficult, but there's going to be fruit in it. And folks, if you are born again of the Spirit, if you have trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you know where the Lord is. He's on the throne. It isn't Governor Murphy. It isn't President Trump. It isn't King so-and-so. The Lord is on the throne because every earthly cabinet and government and monarchy will eventually pass away but the one that we have to trust in is the lord and in times like this as i'm looking around and seeing people's worst behavior it grieves me you know we want to do this ministry to help people more because i'm seeing people and i'm really and i'm really going off on a tangent you know the stores are opening up certain hours for the seniors which is great because the last few weeks People have acted like their base desires. They come in, they're young, they're strong, they're hoarding. Older folks can't find what they need. This type of thing, this pandemic, brings out the best, but it also brings out the worst. And we have to decide what type of Christian we are. And I'm going to say this, shame on any Christian. It's okay to have your personal issues and to pray to God and ask for Him to take it. But shame on any Christian who's going out there with everybody else screaming and it's, listen, we should use precautions. We should listen to the experts. But to, to propagate fear so that the elderly and the disabled and they're terrified, something's wrong with our culture. And the answer is Jesus Christ. 
Because He's the one we get our marching orders from. Because He's on the throne. And let's never forget that. Let's pray. Father in Heaven, Lord, You are so awesome, Lord. And the church has survived for 2,000 years. Your Jewish people have survived through all types of persecution. And they still celebrate Passover. That is an awesome thing. Lord, we just pray as the church went through pandemics, famine, war, horrible persecution, losing loved ones to persecution, and they're still going through that overseas. I just pray that your people would repent of what they need to repent of, get their faces in the book, and see what it is that you want them to do in these difficult times. This is an opportunity. Let the church not miss it. We just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.